Robert Scott Bell, welcome to the Biohacking Secrets Show. Thanks, Anthony. It's really, really great to be with you. I mean, biohacking sounds intimidating to me. I don't know if I can live up to whatever this is. <laughs> don't don't worry. We'll we'll take it easy on you if it's your first biohacking podcast, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll you'll do just fine. Take me back. Do you remember when all this COVID craziness started? Mm-hmm. And it's on every channel and and the fear frequency is strong. Um what were your initial thoughts on what was going on? Well, we, I've been covering so-called epidemics and pandemics for what? Tw- this is my 21st year broadcast uh, media. So I've seen them come. I've seen them go. I've seen the claims. I've seen the exaggerations. I've, I've seen so much. Now, as a homeopathic practitioner, I have a different worldview on causation in what they call infectious disease. So although I didn't always have that because I was raised pharmaceutically in America, Western medicine family, uh, raised to be a doctor and realized the doctors were killing me as a young person. And I didn't want to do that for anybody else. So that changed my, my, my view of what I would end up doing. I was, always knew it would be healing, but I didn't have a word called homeopathy in my vocabulary until I was 24 years of age. So uh, understand where I came from, it flipped my whole entire worldview to where I am today. So if people aren't already there, they might hear the words I'm about to tell you, and they'll say, this dude's crazy. <laughs> but that's okay. I, I've been dealing with that in media for a long time as well. Uh, so when I heard about this uh, claims of a novel new zoonotic or whatever virus that may be engineered coming from a lab in Wuhan, or if we studied back and said maybe it, it originated at UNC Chapel Hill and then was taken out there through a Chinese back door, uh, the reality was and is that I wasn't concerned for people that were generally healthy, that had adequate levels of uh, minerals and nutrients, particularly selenium in their system, that most of uh, uh, claims of viral causation of outbreaks are uh, at the very least gross exaggerations, uh, and, and that's throughout history. And, and so there's something else that, that is more powerful at play, and that is the health of the host, the health of the, the people or persons or anybody who might be exposed to something that they claim will kill you. Most of them have been basically a, a blown up fear-based belief system that have frightened people into believing an alternate form of reality. That is an invisible, what we would call a virus, or I might describe as an exosome that is spewing out from your own cells should there be uh, mineral deficiencies or other things, uh, that they are just like mysterious supervillains that can just at any moment strike up and kill you. And so that fear based on what's known as the germ theory 150 plus years of fear porn, thanks to Louis Pasteur. He was friends with the emperor in France and the overwhelming of the brilliance of Antoine Béchamp through sheer political power. Uh, Not because Pasteur was right, Béchamp was wrong. It's quite the opposite. The law of the terrain explains how health or disease occurs. So this is a long-winded answer to say, I was not concerned about the virus. I was concerned about the fear of a virus, another virus. Just like in our earlier years growing up in the you know, uh, late 60s, 70s, and 80s, when suddenly this thing called HIV that they eventually called it came out, we were all going to die of that. Everybody, right? Yep. Yep. And then right. come to find out that they didn't even have and don't even to this day have a test for HIV. Mm-hmm. Like, whoa, 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 wait a second. They, they, they say they have an HIV. Of course, they say they have it. doesn't make it real. If you read the inserts, it's not uh, you know, viable to determine the presence or absence of this HIV or as a diagnosis for AIDS. You have to have other things involved, questionnaires. It's like, there's no standard. And so the same playbook has been played out since the time of the HIV scam, even today with COVID-19. So I have a different viewpoint on it uh, from the questioning of the reality of the virus. And even if it does exist, that I'm not concerned because I know what makes someone vulnerable to what they call you know, protein spewing out of your own cells or vulnerability if you believe in catching them. Yeah, I want to I want to talk a little bit about some of this and explore it a bit more. So you've you've you shared a lot. I've heard various people speak on HIV, Ebola, H1N1, a lot of these either being man-made 
um, and, and put into the blood supply and, and, and outward. It could be shared sexually or uh, through other means of transmission. Um, and, and then I've also, um, you know, read somewhere about Louis Pasteur on his deathbed, essentially saying like the microbe is nothing. The terrain is everything, meaning like it's, it's, it's the, the health of your cells and your immune system and your mitochondria. And, um, and, and so what you kind of said there is that, oh, and, and you've also made a point that it may not actually be a virus. I, I, if I, I do believe as of right now, certainly uh, Cokes for postulates that, that are necessary in identifying a virus have not been satisfied for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So now we have a few different things. We've got, okay, are people intentionally creating some of this stuff for mm -hmm potentially nefarious purposes or because it makes them money or, you know, through big pharma, et cetera. We've got Louis Pasteur and a lot of this germ theory uh, essentially being discredited by Louis Pasteur himself, but that got very little right. press. And then you've got this exosome theory where is it actually a virus or is it, you know, something else, 5G frequencies causing issues with our cells that then produce exosomes and it's blamed on the virus, but it's something else. Can you kind of run with some of that and help me connect the dots and help maybe some of the listeners connect the dots? Sure. Well, first of all, the germ theory is a victim-based theory. It's a victim consciousness. It means that you are uh, lucky or you're unlucky, right? Doesn't matter what you do. Oops, you got sneezed on, you're dead, right? That's absurd because if the germ theory were accurate, which boiled down into a statement like this, the mere presence of or contact with a pathogen results in disease or death or whatever. Uh, if it were true, there's no explanation for human and animal life. But it's, it's just, it's done. It's, you don't have to do much more to dismantle the germ theory because if it were accurate, the very existence of our microbiome should be deadly. We have more bacteria, maybe fungal species, certainly viruses or exosomes, than we have cells in our body by a factor of at least 10 to 1. It might be 100 to 1. But couldn't someone, couldn't someone say, well, the ones that are in our body, many of them are beneficial and like, yeah, some are inflammatory, but they're none of the deadly ones. You know, like if you get a deadly one, then you're in trouble. So, well, what makes E. coli deadly? You have E. coli in your colon right now. Everybody does. How come you're not dying from a deadly E. coli infection? If you have E. coli, why is it not deadly? I thought it's the deadly E. coli. It's like, well, it's altered via the terrain. The, the, the home that you give it determines what grows there or how it grows or if it expresses new DNA and becomes a supervillain in your body. Mm -hmm. But it's not the cause of your problem. The cause of your problem was that you altered your terrain toward uh, you know, pollution. And in pollution scenarios, you have all kinds of aberrant growths, right? You can look at a healthy, clean, pristine lake. You're not going to find what they call pathogenic life forms. There's bacteria there. Like you said, it's not doing much. It's all a balance. Everything has a food. Everything has a waste. There's a food, right? It all kind of balances out. But the moment you start throwing toxic heavy metals into it, mercury or aluminum, suddenly things that were not there before are mysteriously there. Did they come with the aluminum? Did they come with the mercury? No, you've altered the terrain, and so life transforms to meet the challenge. And then we call that pathogens. We call those disease-causing organisms when they are given rise to remediate a toxic environment. Now, those toxins also deplete critical minerals, like in the case of mercury, selenium is going to be sunk out of the system, or, or aluminum, silica is going to be sunk out of the system, and therefore now you're going to have other aberrant metabolic manifestations. You know, whether it be cellular dysregulation and spewing viral proteins that are known now as exosomes, or in the case of, of silica, your connective tissue becomes weaker and weaker. And then you have the ability for cancer cells that always exist, a little bit here, a little bit there, but never do anything to you. Now suddenly they can take hold and grab and metastasize and shift because your connective tissue becomes so weak. So the terrain explains the manifestation of what are called pathogens, wrongly so, because they are the result of dis-ease or imbalance, not the cause of dis-ease or imbalance. You know, the, mi the, the microbes that you give rise to, you go, oh, that's the bad thing, let's kill it. And so you, then you'll use a toxic chemo drug, like an antibiotic, which is a form of chemo, mm -hmm. to kill it and destroy everything else in the microbiome indiscriminately and create more inflammatory damage to the cells of self. Mm -hmm giving rise to what? Leaky gut or uh, leaky anything. You know, all the obsessiveness with washing our hands with benzoconium chloride or, you know, any number of toxic chemicals or benzoyl alcohols even, drying the skin, causing inflammation and cell separation. Talk about the stuff in hand sanitizer. Yeah, and then you get leaky hands. And you're more mm -hmm. vulnerable by using those things than just simple soap and water. Or mm -hmm. as I just learned today on the show, <laughs> 
in Russia, the scientists found out that the COVID virus is so strong that it can be killed by water. Mm. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Water, right? And of course, that, that goes to the level of, if you ever interviewed when he was alive, Dr. Batman Gelich, the Iranian physician, he was a political prisoner, and he wrote the book, Your Body's Many Cries for Water. How many ailments, illnesses are mis misdiagnosed as a diseases of what? Name the infectious agent. And they're, in fact, chronic low-level dehydration. Mm -hmm. and well, that with, what, results, with what you just said, how many other viruses are killed by water? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Being <laughs> properly hydrated. It's like, what, what are they doing? Nothing. So, no. what you're, uh, can you kind of take us back to your aha moment? Because like this, I've, I've, I've had a steep learning curve in recent months mm -hmm. when all this kind of went down. But with, with HIV, Ebola, uh, uh, many of these different pandemics and outbreaks when was it that you kind of realized there was something else going on mm -hmm. and if you had to kind of summarize what you believe is the playbook mm. what would that be well you know in my early, early 90s i began to learn uh homeopathy uh taught by a brilliant physician out of uh, belgium and studied side by side for over 10 years and in that time frame you know my worldview was being upended right from you know, cancer is a terminal disease and you got to kill it with toxic poisons or infections need to be hit with toxic poisons known as antibiotics, which I was raised on antibiotics and, and mm -hmm. I had inflammatory conditions of the skeletal system since I was a kid. That's what you were referring congestion. to earlier when you said they were basically yeah. killing you. Chronic infections with always on antibiotics and allergy medicines, allergy shots for over 10 years, uh, antacids before the era of proton pump inhibiting drugs, the PPIs that are so devastating the production of acid and any number of problems from that. Uh, so I, I had an epiphany about 18, 19 years of age at university when I, I had been sick for that long and getting shots from the doctors for allergies every month. And I just kind of, I just fed up. And I said, doc, man, I've been sick my whole life with something. Will I ever be well? You know, will I ever be rid of allergies? I've been doing shots for 10 years. Nothing's helping. And they said to me, which I'll give them points for uh, integrity at the moment. They admitted that they didn't know why I was sick at all. Like, we don't even know why you have your allergies. I'm like, dude, I appreciate the honesty, but man, you're not looking impressive to me. What's in if the I, shots? Right? Yeah. <laughs> and I've, what are you and I'm injecting like, me with if you don't know what I, why I've got it? Right? So all of these things are spinning through my head at this moment. And I'm like, I, I think even though doctors were the gods, if you will, because I was raised in medically Western world. Yeah. I realized that at that point, if I continued down this road, I was in big trouble because I was not getting better. I was fatigued. I'm a young, I'm a kid, you know, I'm a young, young adult. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I knew my, my elders, aunts and uncles, grandparents, some of them died of cancer, horrible deaths, but in their seventies and maybe sixties. And I figured just knowing what I knew about their childhoods, cause I was always curious, they were living healthy lives. I said, grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, did y'all have allergies? Even my dad, I said, dad, did everybody have allergies like I have when you were a kid growing up in Brooklyn, New York, and you know, in the 1940s and the 50s, right? And all that. He's like, you know, I never thought about it, but no, there was like one kid who was the sickly kid. We would get a cold or a flu once in a while, and then we'd on our merry way. There was nothing like that. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is a disaster because I've been ill my whole life since year zero. I'm not going to make it to 40, or if I do, I'll be ravaged with cancer that my elders had in their 60s and 70s. So I could put the two and two together. I didn't like what I saw on the math, but I didn't have another option. So I kind of gave up and, and my journey and dream to be a healer or a doctor, because that was the only healer I knew was ended at that point. Because I said, if, if this is healing, being a doctor, I don't want any part of it. I can't do this to other people, what they did to me. So that was the, the hashtag walk away moment for, for medicine for me outside of emergency trauma, which they're good at. And uh, it was about four or five years later where my uh, prayers to God were answered, not by a miracle healing, but by the homeopathic doctor that would end up becoming my mentor to teach me how to heal myself and then help others to do the same. And so there was that epiphany that led to another epiphany. And then of course, in my learning of homeopathic medicine, natural medicine and detoxification of the liver and mineral remineralization with food. And I began to see the scam of infectious claims that that viruses were the cause of disease and this was at the time where i had already been made to fear in the early 80s about this thing that called hiv right that was going to kill everybody it was it was heterosexual at that point too until they have said oh it wasn't and it was a lifestyle disease if you will call it that but that, that i found out the tests were not in fact testing for the presence or absence of a retrovirus called hiv 
that was problematic to begin with. Now, part of that was my learning from my mentor to see through this. Part of it was learning from uh, Professor Peter Duisberg, who, who wrote a number of books in you know, UC Berkeley, brilliant young uh, scientist. Now he, he's older, but uh, he's still brilliant. And then uh, meeting eventually John Rappaport, my good friend, investigative journalist who wrote AIDS Incorporated. And so we began to unravel the mess that was HIV, the scam that it wasn't a virus or retrovirus. It was the fear of the invisible. So dealing with all the claims of a new brand new novel virus or retrovirus that was going to kill everybody by destroying their immune system by some mysterious way, uh, began to find out that that wasn't in fact the case, that people were dying uh, from uh, wrong, poor lifestyle choices, whether it be nutrient uh, deficiencies, toxicological burdens through uh, drug use, some illicit street drugs that are immunosuppressive, or the antibiotics that I mentioned earlier that I was on. That or lack of, lack of sunlight. Some of those lack studies of just showing that lack, like, you know, like less lower vitamin D levels, higher COVID exactly. death rate. And you know, finally, we come to selenium with all what they call viral activity or exosomal activity. Uh, selenium deficiency is always found at the core of it. Ebola remediated with selenium. This uh, claim of COVID-19 in a modern context, remediated by selenium. You know, the studies out of China, whether you believe it's a virus or not, regardless where areas of high selenium content in the, in the soils of the people of China existed, there was little or no impact uh, from the so-called COVID-19. In the areas of, of selenium deficiency in the soils of the people, devastating. We see that around the world. And of course, old people, wherever they are around the world, are often deficient selenium as well because they've been so heavily medicated, comorbidities, drugged out on food, lacking vitamins, minerals, and trace minerals, et cetera, lacking sunlight because they're locked away, as you point out. So all of these things have patterned into a point where I, you know, and we come back to that question about, you know, my viewpoint on COVID-19. Now, I've been doing weekly uh, broadcasts on my radio show with John Rappaport since this all began because he and I have been sharing a journey in, in looking at the medical cartel and the pharmaceutical church and how they claim things that aren't factual, but use the razzle dazzle of now so science and technology to cause people to go, well, they must know what they're talking about because they've got PhDs and MDs and they've got technology. And we come back to PCR. Uh, Kerry Mullis, the Nobel Prize winner who developed it, said it wasn't a uh, technology appropriate to, uh, to isolate an acute or even a chronic infectious agent. It was more of a, a manufacturing technique, if you will, to, to amplify uh, genetic fragments and try to identify them. And so you're so, just, to, just to clarify, you're saying the PCR test, the main test, not the antibody test, which is have you been exposed to COVID and your body mounted uh, an immune response. This is, you know, looking at acute coronavirus infections. The test is bad, is what you're yeah. saying. It's, it's, not, it's not accurate, right? It, it's not accurate. It's not appropriate uh, to identify an acute infectious agent, which is what they're it claiming. It tests for the COVID common is. cold. Doesn't it say in there that this, this is like it tests for the common cold? Well, when you're going to the antibody test, yeah, because okay. it, it, they don't differentiate between coronaviruses and reality. So you have a nonspecific cross-reactive antibody test, much like most HIV tests as well. Mm -hmm. If you're using PCR, they say RT-PCR, oh, that's different. That's very accurate because they take a fragment of genetic sequence and they compare it against you know, unknown genetic material in a nasal swab or something. And they mm -hmm. amplify it hundreds of millions and billions of times. And I'm not exaggerating for effect to say that, oh, it's there. It's not only there, it's killing you. Really, there's no basis. They haven't standardized it in any way, shape, or form to, to identify that as a, a fact in any way. So they don't know. I mean, they never like blinded or double blinded these tests and said, all right, let's compare them with the patients that it was, you know, out our predictions based on what this test is saying. Oh, this person is dead, is a goner. This person, oh, it's a mild infection. This person may be in, to find out if the person you said is dead is out on the golf course, right? They've never done that. So there's no basis for them making the claims other than a pharmaceutical fantasy and fear porn to lock down people in a permanent state of fear of one another, including yeah, the, the whole masking. Issue, you know? The irony that there's so much talk of science and I've never seen more of a propagation of BS in my entire life. There's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna save his name because he's, he's kind of got this published behind a, a paywall to, mm -hmm. but one of my friends wrote this and he said, COVID-19 is an unprecedented phenomenon because it has fostered an unscientific thinking epidemic in the public, fueled by the media. It is truly shocking what is happening in the media. Science is being utterly trashed and rehashed to create junk news narratives to control people with fear. 
This is written by one of my friends who is a neurosurgeon. Give him a and, kudos from me because, dude, he nailed it. That's yeah. beautifully written exact, and, and, and accurate as well. They are destroying what is left of science. If there's scientific integrity and it's not an oxymoron, that guy sees it. And, uh, you know, I'm with, I'm with them all the way. The point is, this is a, this is a complete fiction that they've made up. The belief system is more powerful than a, than any real virus. You don't need a real virus. And this is what I saw in the time of the HIV scam. They figured out the playbook. They turned immunology up on, on, on its head, right? Before HIV, having an antibody meant you were going to live, you successfully encountered and overcame. In the area of HIV, suddenly that was turned upside down. Koch's postulates no longer mattered, as you pointed out earlier. And an antibody meant you were going to die, which is always the weird thing about the billions spent on a, a HIV vaccine. It's like, how are you going to tell the difference between an antibody stimulated artificially by a vaccine versus what they say happened because of an infection? Oh, and I asked that question of John Rappaport last week on the show. He was funny. He's like, yeah, I got an inside scoop. They said we were going to issue certificates that you would carry with you so that when you got an HIV positive test, you could say, see, look, it's because of the vaccine, like a little certificate. It's like the Tin Man getting, you know, uh, in the Wizard of Oz, a little certificate that he has a, a heart or something or a brain or, the, you know, whatever. It's just absurd. This is what we're dealing with. And so that playbook has played itself out numerous times in, in viral fear porn every year with the flu season. And now, of course, with COVID-19 without evidence. And you say, RT-PCR, it's a test. Well, yeah, it's a test. It's a manufacturing test. It's not identifying an acute infectious agent. And whether you arguably claim either it has been or has not been isolated, the, this novel coronavirus, it's still not a test that says, oh, you have an acute infection, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's no basis for that. And then we go to the antibodies to say, what is it testing for? Well, not COVID-19. Any coronavirus can trigger a positive. So, and, and they, the tests get crappier as they go because they, they realize they don't need them. All they have to do is make people afraid and they'll, they'll believe anything they're told. The bigger the lie, the bigger the whopper, the more mm -hmm. believable it is. Mm -hmm. So I guess when we're saying they, mm -hmm. right? You know, I have, I have some of my theories and um, you're welcome to share any that you, you're comfortable with. I mean, I look at it as a lot of this, these are the same people that have been driving, you know, the, the, the medical mafia, as you said, the medical cartel, uh, you said pharmaceutical church, which I feel like is almost insulting to the church, um, maybe <laughs> the church of church of Satan. <laughs> um, what's well, is, is this, is this the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, a lot of these big families that, you know, were some of the, the, the early people to accumulate mass amounts of wealth that are then using the medical cartel to not only further pad their pockets, but to keep people enslaved and, and, and hoping that these people, um, it seems like the best case scenario for the medical cartel is for people to die a slow, expensive death. Like mm -hmm. that's sort of the path that you were on up until 19 when you had your yeah. epiphany. Um, Am, am, am I making some false assumptions and, and things that don't check out because of my steep learning curve? What, what's, what's your take? Well, uh, no, I, I don't think you're making false assumptions, actually. Um, it's just how deep down the rabbit hole do you want to go, right? We mm -hmm. can talk about the pharmaceutical cartel, but behind them are always the international bankers. Mm -hmm. uh, Luciferian agendas to keep people under control, to keep them away from you know, God consciousness, self-realization, if you will, to recognize who they are in their relationship to creation itself. Keep people off balance, off base enough that they live in enough fear that they look to authoritarian dictators to save them, whether they be doctors, pharmaceutical people, media people, political people that are bought off, compromised or compromised into blackmail scenarios where you have people in America uh, doing things that are d destroying America, right? Mm -hmm. You know, pro-Chinese things, uh, you know, any number of things that are pro-communism and socialism. Like, why would they do that? Well, they they probably went to Epstein's Island and that was set up for the explicit purpose to compromise folks so that you can control them. It's easier than buying them off. Just hear the pictures, do as I say, or else these go, you know, that's the, that's the nature of what happens behind the scenes. It's, it is very Luciferian, but that's the way it's played. So mm -hmm. we can go up to the banker's level and, you know, we can go into, you know, kind of spiritual warfare discussions, but it's all meant to disconnect us from our true source, mm -hmm. God, spirit, however you call it, however you define it. Uh, and this, this fear of the virus is one of those things that's saying, well, yeah, you can have your God, you can worship him, just not on Sundays or Saturdays with everybody else, because now it's too dangerous to get together and certainly don't sing in church. 
and mm -hmm. de definitely wear a mask and have six feet of separation based on no mm -hmm. science on and on it goes. And they've criminalized the act of breathing, the very act of, of life itself, which is dependent upon our ability to breathe in the air, remove, you know, pull the oxygen in and then the exhaust gas, the CO2 is pulled out and they said, let's concentrate that. Let's keep that close to the vest. And, and then let's train our children to be afraid of other people and afraid of themselves should they breathe without a mask because they might kill somebody. Is that not a Luciferian agenda? My gosh, this goes deep, doesn't it? This yeah. is not just about one layer or one level. There are a lot of interests, either they're competing or they're commensurate, and they'll profit. So there's a lot of layers to it, and that's why you can get lost down a bunch of different rabbit holes. But fundamentally, this is a war on our identity, mm -hmm. our spiritual identity. Yes, we have a human body. We exist here now at this point in, the, in these bodies that are damaged by a lack of oxygen or any number of toxic pollutions. And then we blame the evil of the, the virus or the germ in a sense. And so that we are absolved of any guilt by living improperly, making bad choices, right? In the era of age, you know, whether you, you know, this is not pro-gay, anti-gay, anything. It's just like, if you do some of the things that that community did to one another, what did you expect? There were doctors who predicted a devastating plague to the destruction of their immune system long before they pretended it was an HIV thing because mm -hmm. they were doing such things that were just destructive of their intestinal tract that just resulted in the immune collapse. It was predicted. Mm -hmm. And so they have to blame somebody eating a monkey's brain in Africa or a, a manufactured virus in a lab. You know, these are all canards that are set up to absolve any of us from having to make better choices about hygiene, sanitation, sewage, nutrition, lifestyle, vitamin D, sunshine, all of that, drinking water, good, clean water distracts us from that. We don't have to take those choices in our own hands because it's a bad stroke of luck. It's, it's a bug that got us, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a victim state of consciousness versus the empowerment of the law of the terrain, that we are co-creators of our life, our world, our environment, and we participate in its destruction and our demise in the same way we participate in rebuilding and repairing and regenerating the health and vitality that is ours by virtue of our birthright. Mm -hmm. But we have been given the freedom to screw up big time. And the things that I screwed up on in ignorance or my parents' ignorance, I don't curse them or myself for doing those things. I didn't know. But mm -hmm. the opportunity to learn is like, I know this indelibly, and now I can tell and teach others to do the same or better in their healing. That yep. for me is finding our mission, our path in life. What is it? To be afraid like little sheeple? or to mm -hmm. embrace our divinity. And what does that mean? Identifying why you're here, right? Yeah. And that changes things. Yeah. I've spent a lot of time on this recently and, and had many conversations with my brother because I've gone down some of the rabbit holes and, and been a little surprised at what I've found and what has checked out. And I think, you know, on one hand, I want us to be able to have a conversation that could encourage people to question the narrative. You don't need to believe everything that we're talking about here. And, and, and the reality is that, you know, at any given point, 50% of what we know is true and 50% of what we believe to be true is, is not factual. The problem is we don't really know what 50% and I'm, I'm just butchering a, a quote there. But mm -hmm. um, before we kind of give people some recommendations for focusing on, on God consciousness and creation and stepping into our power, rather not, not giving these things away, um, you know, and, and how you reconcile staying informed with the fact that so much of what keeps you informed takes you into a fear consciousness or an anger <laughs> consciousness yeah. or a rage consciousness. And then you're right. like, oh, are they just feeding off me right now? This negative emotion, they just <sighs> sucking it up and loving yeah. it, you know, like, so I'm, I'm balancing that. But to, to like, let's say you're a fly on the wall uh, of um, some of some of the, the, the people behind these agendas, right? You've got the um, fear versus love agenda, move them towards fear, you know, move them away from God, right? Then you've got like the power control agenda. You've got the money uh, slash vaccine agenda, right? What do you feel is, what's, what's, what are their overarching agendas and, and how do you, so, where do you put those on the totem? You know, is it like separate from God above all else? And like, right. you know, money's a byproduct. Like, it, this is just, just hypothetically, what's, what do you believe to be true? Well, you, you've described part of my journey as well. And I, and I acknowledge you for that because you've seen it, you've lived it, and you, you know it. That is, there were times in this journey of discovery and uncovering these deep, dark truths that were horrific. There were times I didn't want to get out from under my covers. It was so scary. 
Uh, and then there's the anger. There's all of that, all of those emotions that I've felt over time. And I'm not saying that I've never felt them now or recently. Yeah, I'm human. And, and I have to, you know, cycle through those things. But to your point as well, I don't want that to be my new existence because that will feed into the fear that will feed right into their agenda, their dark agenda of separation from God and spirit from source from identity, true identity. They always try to artificially identify us and make us identify with something less than who we really are because in that way, they have control over us because they separate us by putting things in between us and our connection to source, right? So if, if I am to, you know, pick apart every agenda, you know, that's a, there's somewhat of a mechanical aspect to that. You know, if you want to get into that, it, it's easy to get lost in that. And there's a, you know, there is a study of that and that could be helpful, but it's also uh, fraught with danger because you could get so lost in the morass of fear and anger and all of these emotions that can overtake you that you, you lose your way. And, and that's a freedom we have to, a choice to make to say, how deep do we want to go down that rabbit hole before it affects us and we become that, right? So if I'm to step back from it and try to look with the 360 degrees soul kind of viewpoint, uh, that's where I want to go. And I want to say, does this bring me closer to love, divinity, to God? Does this move me away from it and make that the litmus? You know, the people in my life, are they uplifting me? Am I uplifting them versus do I feel denigrated or somehow detracted or dirty? You know, these are the kind of things we can apply once we learn these principles in every aspect. So we don't have to be lost in the minutia of saying, well, I didn't study that area, so I don't know it. It's like, no, yes, you do. You have, if you want to go into comic book scenarios, spider senses, right? Mm -hmm. you, we have the, the senses that have been dormant. We've ignored, we've suppressed through drugs and other things. And we've got to enliven them and practice them all of the time. And in that way, we can see through it no matter what scenario they throw, because there's always a curveball. Like at the end of the devil's advocate with, uh, you know, what's the, what's the guy, uh, Al Pacino, yep. right? Vanity <laughs> always gets them in the end, right? There's always a way you can be deceived. As long as we have the physical body here, we are vulnerable. We must practice our spiritual, uh, let's say, exercise, our prayer, our connection. Let's break this down into a game plan, a war map, if you will, of how to step outside mm -hmm. their game. Um, I'll share some of the things that I've started doing and plan on doing, and then I want to kind of give you free reign to run with uh, your take and any other recommendations that I miss. Mm -hmm. um, turn off the news, turn off these channels that are using mind control tactics that the CIA has been learning about since MK Ultra, you know, 60 years. And they're now applying through many of these channels that are only owned by a few individuals, many of which are the same individuals that we're talking about. So turn off the news, pray. Uh, prayers become a much more um, prevalent part of my life. It's been my intention to deepen my connection with God. And, um, you know, my aunt had asked if she could share little Bible verses via text. I'm sharing those on, on Instagram and our biohacking secrets account. Um, let's talk about the, 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 the terrain and that part of the protocol. Cause you know, if, if, if there is a virus and this is a threat, a lot of people want to know that they're taking the right amount of selenium, that they're getting adequate sunshine, that they're, you know, taking vitamin C, or whatever else it is, eating lots of mineral rich and, and, and uh, foods that, are, that, that contain the necessary trace elements and vitamins and minerals and phytochemicals, self-sufficiency. I've mm -hmm. taken this as an opportunity to get some land. I'm going to be growing food. Uh, I'm going to have a garden and it's going to be where I, I have, I want as little money as necessary going to Mm -hmm. the, some of these institutions are charging for things that, that um, as a tax, right? Mm -hmm. Loving your neighbor, paying attention to who your tribe is and who you connect with and who you spend a lot of time with. Um, trusting your intuition and developing your intuition so you can smell bullshit because it's <laughs> everywhere. There's yeah. so much bullshit. And when you trust your intuition and you do things to open up, you know, your first eye, depending on which, you know, some, some cultures would refer to it or your, your intuition, your instinct. And then where does civil disobedience obedience fit in here? Where does it like, I'm not wearing your fucking mask, you know, drawing the line of like, okay, if I really need to wear it to support a local business and have a conversation, a compassionate conversation with a small business owner, you know, about how they could probably be making more money with a little bit of civil disobedience rather than possibly putting themselves on a slow bleed path where their business is going to, is going to go under anyhow, having those conversations. What's your game plan pieces from that things you're doing? What, what do you prioritize? Well, I like, I like what you've brought out. And in fact, 
you know, growing food is like printing money in a sense, right? And, and that, to me, is a primary uh, starting point. And I know we're partway through the summer when we're recording this uh, in the northern hemisphere. And uh, depending on where you are, how long your growing season is, that's something uh, I have seen more and more interest in gardening than ever before, which is good. People are realizing that. So going back to some of the basics of our ancestors, which, you know, grew food and canned food, and preserved it as well for lean times. So that's part of the process, making yourself less vulnerable to outages and, and, you know, disruptions in what they call the, the, the food supply or the, you know, the re, resupply chain. Uh, so, it, it, you know, if you're hungry, you're at the mercy of somebody who promises to give you a scrap of anything. Uh, and if you're in a place where you're the only one with food and everybody around you is starving, then you become the, you know, uh, the, the focus of their affection. <laughs> mm-hmm. And not in a kind way, maybe in a way that they want to eat you. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and how many bullets you have, right? So uh, as much as I believe in the right to self-defense and, and uh, advocate for it, uh, the reality is we need to do better than just buckle up into an island. We've got to find out a way to outreach. So it's what you've learned and what you're doing in the biohacking concept is communicating it out and helping others to recognize and empower them these very same things. Now, they have to apply them and you can't do it for them. But at the same time, you know, your hand is out for when somebody genuinely is needing help and they're sincere about it. And that's what I found. You know, if you try to beat people into submission to tell them they need help, you're going to destroy yourself in the process. So part of it is learning discernment and, you know, who, who is sincere in wanting help and that you can help or who can help you uh, in those times of needs. And that's about what you've said, not only following your intuition, but establishing and building relationships based on um, experience, you know, of who, who is there for you and who you're there for. Um, that's very real. Now, that can be disrupted if those people are misdirected by all the things you mentioned like media as well believing the pronouncements of, of officials and government etc uh, so you got to be careful because just like in the concept of the matrix if you're in it um, you are genuinely a threat to those who no longer desire to be in it or or need it or seek any help from it uh, so as you gain independence you will by definition lose folks even in your family that can't can't conceive of going where you're going now, many of them are waking up as they get hungry, and by then it may be too late. Uh, so the spiritual hunger, I think, is important, what you said about prayer. And, and I know there are different ways people say, this is the way to pray, this is the way. you got to find that way. What is the way that lights up your heart with that connection, whether it be an intuitive in- inclination or a light that opens up your eyes, all of them, right, to see some of these truths. Uh, deception is everywhere, as you called it, bullshit, but it's deception. And we're always you know, vulnerable to it. And so we have to sharpen our senses, our intuition, or however you describe it. And how do we practice that? And I say that just like um, we, we physically exercise our bodies to stay physically fit as our ancestors work the land and, and, and push their bodies to limits we can't even conceive of. You know, we try to do that almost artificially in gyms, but however you do it, uh, you do it because you realize how important it is while you're here. But how do we exercise spiritually, right? And it could be, you know, spending time in researching and reading uh, Bible or whatever the spiritual texts that, that uplift you. Uh, and then, you know, could be chanting of sacred words, right? You know, whether you come from the Jewish tradition and you, you read uh, from the Torah and you, you chant it. I mean, these are things that carry a vibration or mantras, you know, for people from the Eastern uh, way of, of living. These things are, are it tend to uh, ground you in a spiritual presence as opposed to uh, taking you off like the media does in a, into a place of fear. If it's driving you to fear, it's, as I say, it's probably not of God. Uh, so that these are the things that are litmus, if you will, as we experience uh, these things. Now, as far as other things to, to get you beyond the fear of a virus or whatever pathogen they claim or infection that's going to get you, uh, we talk about key minerals. And, you know, I do a show, my, the Robert Scott Bell Show, two hours plus a day, six days a week. And so I, I highlight and spotlight uh, not only my experiences, but others who have you know, come before me and after me that are doing great work in empowering people with substances or, or frequencies, vibrations, quantum concepts as well. Uh, but from a brass tax perspective, I'm going to go to the minerals like selenium again, we talked about. Getting them from 100% whole food sources, I believe, is very important because um, there are synthetic isolates in the dietary supplement world that are amino acid chelates that people are all into but don't realize that you can only be fractionally uh, benefited by them because they're not how they appear truly in food or food sources. So, uh, you know, I try to direct people and I don't make or sell any supplements. So it's not like I'm profiting from them, but things that have worked for me clinically in my life in my family's life and in people that I've helped. 
Um, so I, you know, I wrote a book with my buddy Ty Bollinger called Unlock the Power to Heal, which gives a lot of basic insight into some of these basic minerals and self-help, first aid and other things. Uh, and, you know, part of it is we were, uh, we had abandoned long before you and I were here physically, uh, we had abandoned our own owner's manual and, uh, and, you know, kind of looked to these pharmaceutical representatives of, of the medical state doctors to do for us that which we were required to do for ourselves. And so they convinced us that every ailment, illness, symptom, emotion is a deficiency of a pharmaceutical drug approved by the FDA. That's absurd, right? And so we kind of gave up on caring for our own bodies and we said, we'll put it to an elite ruling class. They'll care for us, right? Or whether they be in government mandated monopolies. Uh, so we've got to take back that power, go back to the, the medicine of our ancestors. You know, if we have grandmas still alive that knew that or, you know, going to other regions of the world where uh, herbalism is still available or homeopathy now in a more recent context, it's only a couple of hundred years now. Uh, so we've got to take that. And I'm not saying everybody has to be their own doctor, although we must do better at least some basic things, but to establish who is valuable in our localist of local cultures, if we call them the medicine man or the medicine woman, they were not uh, poisoning people back to health, right? That's an absurdity. And so we've got to get back to those people of those of that knowledge, tribal knowledge. Maybe they've gone through schooling that is available to get us back to that tribal knowledge. That's fine too. But these things are empowering and they alleviate the fear. And when people come visiting with fear porn, you can look at them and laugh and go, stupidest thing I've ever heard. Sorry, not going. Uh, you know, and you can laugh in the face of their fear. And that's where you got to be because, you know, that laughter connects you to the source. You know, that humor is part of, of God, you know, it's uplifting. And uh, as much as it's sad and we would cry because some people are not awake to it, we have to laugh in the face of it or else we will cry. And we don't want to go down that road if we don't have to. It's a great point. Paying attention to the emotional impact of either the thoughts and feelings and words that you are experiencing or expressing mm -hmm. or the your your response to stimuli in your environment you know things there's there's a, a whole category of people out there right now and i've been guilty of this where i believe that they their intention is to do good to spread awareness to help people quote unquote wake up and yet at the same time the dominant emotion that they are causing in people consuming their material is fear yeah and I, I think we need to be conscientious of that because they may not even be aware that they're doing it. But if it's having that effect on you, you should be very uh, frugal with mm -hmm. the amount of their content that you consume. Um, mm -hmm. you, you just kind of open up a can of worms for a whole bunch of different questions. But let's first dive in. You'd mentioned outages. Um, I've considered food, power, water being right. possible outages and possibly even something that would be done intentionally. Have you prepared for those? And if so, how? Yeah, the best, the best way you can is to have options, you know, it, it, you know, short term and, and perhaps some long term as well. Now, anywhere around the world, if you're in a hurricane zone, an earthquake zone, I mean, th there are intermittent outages that, that can be devastating for a time, but they don't tend to go on for years. Uh, some people are predicting that, you know, whatever's happening could be years long scenarios. I, you know, I don't know that, that I would admit sounds kind of scary. If we've grown up in a West where we had easy access to food and water and housing, it's hard to conceive of not having easy, immediate access. Like you wake up in the morning, you don't fear for your life typically in the West, in America, or even Canada, you think, well, I'll get up, I'll go to work, I'll have my coffee or I have my meal, I can go out and get, and so those things are, are not the same everywhere. I, I've been to areas of the world like West Africa, where the people did not have a reasonable expectation when they woke up in the morning that they were going to survive the day. And of course, in those cases, you look at, they have developed, if, if they're surviving this, they've adapted by developing an absolute reliance on spirit. You want to call it Holy Spirit, divine spirit, God, Faith. that it isn't because, well, I can, because I want to, it's like, they have to, right? There is no, I can rely on something physical out here that's for us so just there. It's not just there for them. And so it's, a, I learned a lot by visiting them to see how much they valued and appreciate life and had an absolute reliance on spirit to survive the day. So that is, you know, about intuition. It's about listening to the voices that are not the media or not those that elicit the fear in you. And now you could get a message from spirit. Hey, don't go down that dark alley. There's danger there. And you might get a sense of tinge of fear that can be useful and helpful. 
but it's it's another thing when it's driving every moment and movement in your life that's different and I, and I think about this when I do do the show Anthony at the end of the show it's like how would I feel if I heard that show or watched that show am I at that show and like oh my god that was the scariest show I've ever seen right mm. I'm like no I never want to leave people with that and I will acknowledge and I'll verbalize it too I'll say listen I know that this subject seems to be intimidating could be scary but it is try, it, they're trying with this story that I'm covering right now to distract you from your divinity. Come mm -hmm. back to that. Pray, chant, love. Come back to spirit. And you, there's nothing to be afraid of, even though you know, the, your old self would not have seen through it. Now you can see through it. So we can cover those stories without leaving people in that state of trepidation and fear, like you pointed out. And I'm very aware of good shows trying with good intentions to do good things, but pointing out, leaving people in abject terror with these subjects. And I think that yeah. also is a little bit irresponsible, although the freedom to do it is theirs and the freedom to listen and watch and indulge in that is theirs. But that's just not where I go. And I know, I know that's a reason why, uh, you know, a lot of people still haven't heard of the Robert Scott Bell show because I don't engage in fear porn. People, you know, have to have a fix like an adrenaline rush, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of media, it maybe it takes them from the mainstream media to new media that fulfills their, oh, I need that adrenaline rush. I'm like, yeah, we can play that game. But you know, it, it, for me, it's only to, to teach and then inspire you to go beyond that because that's a, a fleeting feeling that can often be used to manipulate you, right? Mm -hmm. and, and drive you away from your true nature, so to speak. Yeah. If you were to share one of your favorite practices that is like a daily habit for that, uh, you know, maintaining and deepening that spiritual connection. And then, um, Part two of that question is something that if you want to elevate your vibration, something you know that if and when you do it, you will be closer to that love consciousness, that God consciousness afterwards. Well, I think starting the day with intention. Uh, for me, you know, I, I will declare myself a, a vehicle or a channel for divine love, for the Holy Spirit, for God. Now, you know, people have different backgrounds and religious beliefs, so they might use Christ or Christ consciousness or Jesus. So I, I never try to dictate to people what they should do, because that for me, I've, I've been the, rec the recipient of that growing up in a small minority religion for much of my life and being beaten up by the majority religion and, and con you know, attempted conversion. So I, I really respect people's paths in life and that we've been given the freedom by God to come to God of our own accord, not by force or fear, even though a lot of people play that. Uh, so when I say, you know, I declare myself a vehicle for divine spirit, realize I want people to hear however the language works for you. What is that thing that connects you to love, to God, to your divinity? And, and so you can modify anything that I do into your comfort zone, so to speak. So by declaring it so consciously, and, and it's a habit to form, uh, you begin to see things in your life that used to be things that happened to you, and now they, they happen for you, right? Now you're no longer a victim of stuff that happens, but you're like, what is God, what is this gift that I'm being given? And this, uh, this thing that I used to curse and go, this is the most horrible thing ever. It's like, where is the gift in this? Because you realize everything is truly for our benefit, not our detriment. And even the times where I've suffered great ailments and deceptions, they were so that I could learn and grow spiritually. So it's a difference in viewpoint of the world itself so that even we see the, the so-called evil and Luciferian agenda is designed by God because God created everything to help us ultimately, to uplift us, to allow us to really want it bad enough that, that you know, I liken it to uh, how bad do you want oxygen when your head is being held underwater? And to some degree, you'll find that unless you want God that badly or that much, you'll be swayed from that path because you'll be, you know, a little bit of sweetness over here and you're off to another thing. Oh, that's really. And so how, how much do you have to suffer before you come back and realize, you know what, all of that stuff was fine for a while, but you know, I don't need that anymore. And mm -hmm. also to not get too cocky about it either, because I'm still in a body and I still can be deceived. Mm -hmm. And so to be humble enough to re recognize that there's always another step to take. And, and that's true as me uh, uh, as a homeopath to learn more as a healer. And it's true as a, I believe a spiritual being to, to, you know, there's always another step or another level of, uh, of a deeper understanding of God's love and divinity and, and our place in that and, and, and our uh, existence, you know, as the gift that it is. Um, but recognizing who we are on a constant basis, that it, it takes effort. It takes practice. And as I talk about spiritual exercise, if it's chanting sacred words, uh, you know, it's what, what are a few it, examples of those? What are the phrases sure. or the words that you chant most often? Well, I was married in a, in a, in a temple, my wife and I, uh, and we, uh, 
were married by a woman from Ghana who's like family to me and her husband, wonderful people. And they handed me, they had a, a, a Christian Bible uh, that was written in Fanti, the native language. And it was interesting. It talked in that Christian Bible about the lost word. And I've learned of, of you know, the words through Judaism as well, you know, the chanting of words, sacred words. Uh, some, like as I said, in the Eastern religions, they have mantras, they have different things. And so I learned of the lost word, even from that Christian Bible, affirmed what I learned elsewhere, uh, this word called hu, H-U. And it's an ancient and sacred name for God. And it's interesting because the root hu, human means God, God men, that we are, you know, created in the image of God. Now, I don't think physically the body, it meant that. A lot of people interpret it that way. But that only, if you believe that you are a physical being that has a soul, it's like that, that never struck me right. It's like, wait, how do I possess what I am? Or could I be that soul that is inhabiting a body while I'm here that I'm trying to care for as a temple, a sacred gift? And then I leave it and I continue on as a spiritual uh, being that I always was. I was just in this body. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, utilizing the word hue, hue, sacred ancient name, integrating that into my daily prayer or meditation or contemplation has been extraordinarily uplifting, opened my heart to the divine love of God. And, um, you know, if you want to sing and chant Jesus, that's, that's fine. The point is finding something that uplifts you, that opens you up to experiencing the, the true nature of reality and God, uh, which I believe we are capable of doing, because if we are children or creations of God, divine sparks of God, why not? Why can't we? And what can we do to get there? These are the things, as you talk about biohacking, the spiritual realm. It's not cheating. It's just embracing our uh, divinity. And these are the things that can help. Mm -hmm. And in the biohacking space, I've witnessed many times where people reach a glass ceiling by only focusing on body and mind and neglecting the spirit in yes. part because I, I believe in, in hindsight, when I look through things with the, the, the current glasses that I have on, I, I feel that there's been a, a disinformation campaign and an, a, I, I hate to use the word agenda again, but you see people like Bill Maher you know, who's in the red shoe club, which, you know, people can look into if they want. And like one of the movies that really had a profound impact on me separating from God and organized religion was his movie Religulous mm. and how it basically, if you were to sum up the movie in one sentence, if you believe in religion, you're stupid. Mm. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and it wasn't until I started investigating these things and saying, no, you can't just optimize body and mind. You need to recognize the fact that we are spiritual beings having a human yeah. experience. We have soul contracts, mm -hmm. things that we have agreed to do uh, and let flow yes. through us, you know, and, and when we are not paying attention to and respecting that, through the way that we are living, we will continue to feel empty and cut off until we do. Yeah, and I, and I do recognize the controversy surrounding the history of religion on the planet. You know, it's, it's not all spiritual, wonderful, lovey-dovey stuff, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of terror and blood and guts and destruction. And, you know, so again, it, it, it's subject to all the things we're subject to while we are in human form, uh, mm -hmm. the, the deception. Um, now, that doesn't mean I'm anti-religion at all. I, I've, I've found it to be quite uplifting to come together and worship and, and praise and sing and chant and all of these things. And whether it's a drum circle in an, uh, you know, an informal get together or whether it's in a 501c3 church, synagogue or mosque, which, you know, I argue that being a 501c3 organization subjugates you to a, you know, a secular control, as we've seen where government says you can't now come together and worship and sing, right? So there are uh, you know, nuances to this discussion that are important to have. And Let's I, have I those. Because I was I, just writing down, like, what, what options truly exist? What, because we've got mandates, we've got laws, you've got things that directly uh, run counter to our constitutional rights mm -hmm. taking place. Like, if, if, if you say, no, I'm not wearing a mask, I have a medical exemption, and someone yeah. says, uh, well, what is it? Can you just say, uh, I don't have to tell you, and then not wear a mask? Is it as simple as, like, what options do churches and places of worship have you know what's a mandate versus a law and what can we do legally right now yeah to, to worship and to protect our right to breathe well first of all recognize that again rights come from god not government but organized religion which has subjugated itself to uh, uh government control through special requests of privileges tax status which are acknowledged in the constitution long before there was an irs so 
uh, you don't need to register your church as a, you know, a 501c3 to be tax exempt. It's just a fact, but people have long lost that. And that's, you know, how government has controlled these churches and limited the speaking from the pulpit of people who would talk, dare say things about the spiritual beliefs as they relate to the body politic, for instance. And they, they muzzle and restrict speech all of the time through that. So First Amendment is limited, despite First Amendment saying Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So we are, you know, we are gro greatly confused by all of this, and rightly so. Now, some of it is, you know, a Rosa Parks moment of what some might call civil disobedience, but I would call it spiritual obedience because, you know, that which is uh, mandated or prohibited by government that violates your contract with the most holy, the most high, the God uh, or the creator, uh, there I feel an obligation to do what I am commanded by that which created me. And I'm not a creature of government, although we have been deceived into believing that we are through uh, stealing our identity and numbering us like cattle, right? And that's a big, big problem uh, for certain benefits and privileges. Uh, so to uh, disobey unjust laws or mandates or executive orders uh, is, is showing obedience to, to God, and, and it's appropriate. Now, until you are of that mind and consciousness, uh, you might deceive yourself into believing that you're breaking the law by doing so. And if so, you carry a consciousness of guilt that is not yours, except you adopt it because you have that freedom to adopt it. God gave us that freedom, as I said, to co-create our life. Uh, so getting to the place of spiritual identity and spiritual principles and knowing them well enough that you recognize when you are doing things in the eyes of government or even your neighbor who says, how dare you not wear a mask, etc." You know you are obedient to God. You have no not an ounce or a shred of uh, adoption of that belief system. So it literally has nowhere to go. Their belief like bounces off of you, you know, because you don't know, you don't embrace it. You, it takes you accepting it and bringing it in. It's not enough for them to call it out at you. Now, once you are so solid in your understanding and belief and practice, a, a million, a billion people could tell you you're wrong and it won't sway you. You know, whether it be a Galileo moment, an Ignace Semmelweis moment to wash your hands before, you know, birthing a baby after cutting up on the cadavers, right? And, you know, everybody's against you, but you know what's right despite all of that. And, you know, there's uh, certainly plenty of examples in history, and some people have been martyred for that. So you always have to be sensitive to the spiritual signaling or communication on a subtle level to say, you know what, just wear the mask for this moment in this time, like you talked about going into a small business to help in that case, to serve spiritually. So it's not that you can't serve spiritually by adopting things you know are not needed in certain times, but I would ask that you don't listen to the president or a governor or even a doctor at that point. Listen to the voice of spirit direct you in that moment because it could shift. Same thing tomorrow. And it says, do not put on that mask. Whatever you do, do not put. And so it's, it's always sensitive to the moment and the needs of those, not only yours, but those around you spiritually, because you can serve to uplift them or you could serve, uh, you know, to, to denigrate them in, a, in another way, even though they're attempting to do to you. I don't, I don't feel like we need to do to them just because they do it to us. That's that you know, kind of Old Testament wrath of God stuff, you know, just take an eye for an eye. We can be better than that. We can transform consciousness by not uh, uh, let's say degrading into that level of behavior. Now, there may be times again, when we are asked to defend ourselves and it gets very uncomfortable, but always remember if you're willing to be, maybe, maybe it's called will, willing to be a fool for God, right? You're being called to do something that everybody's going to look at you in some way. You're going to feel very uncomfortable, but you know what you're doing and why and who's directing it. You don't have that ego in front at that moment. So it, nothing anyone says can harm you in that sense, right? So it's a transformation of consciousness by living, by practicing the things we're discussing, whether it's singing the sacred names for God, whatever you believe them to be, whether it's you or other things. These things will strengthen you along the way in the same way that you work your physical body and strengthen your body, and you're resilient in the midst of, of something that you didn't know you were training for. Mm -hmm. And you get there, and you're like, oh my gosh, all of that work? Like, you know, go back to the Karate Kid movie. Uh, wax on, wax off, and suddenly in the midst of a battle, you, all these motions are memory for you. And it isn't a, necessarily a conscious or mental construct. It really is a spiritual connection now that cannot be severed in that moment because it's too strong that all the evil in the world will attempt it and it will not work. So what are the forms of spiritual obedience 
or for people that identify more with the vernacular civil disobedience that you feel are will be most effective at this mm. point in time okay here's the concept of, of the most powerful thing you have is not a weapon it's not a gun even though i'm again a big supporter of the right to self-defense it's withdrawing your consent that is simply i do not consent now th that's a big step because for so long you know in a civil context you thought well uh, I am governed and I have to follow this edict or this law or this prohibition. And suddenly you wake up and realize, my gosh, this is a bunch of garbage, crap, whatever you want to call it. And it, and it in fact violates my fundamental rights. You know, and when I woke up and saw all of the deceptions that were occurring, and I'm not saying I saw all of them, but all that I could conceive of and see, I began to live my life differently and made very difficult decisions that were not difficult. They were scary at times because I was kind of between two worlds of, obedience to God versus obedience to the state. Uh, everybody's doing it, so it must be right, right? So I, I gave up and stopped using the social security number, which I never applied for. It was just given to me, right? And when I got married, we didn't get a license. We didn't ask for permission from the state. We didn't invite the state into our sacred relationship. It was between me, my spouse, and God. And then when our kids were born, we didn't get birth certificates. We recorded their births in the family Bible. They were not numbered like beasts in the field. They have no tax ID, social security numbers because I didn't want to make them collateral for a Luciferian debt that could never be repaid. I wanted to give them the opportunity to be free of that so that when they're adults of sound mind and body of age of consent, that they can choose if they decide to enter that realm in full consciousness or the best that I can do as a parent in raising them to recognize things that we were consciously, well, we were unconscious, completely unconscious about. We just blindly went along because that's generationally the shift and deg degradation, the movement away from spirit and the movement toward worship of government, not God. And so these are very practical steps and everybody has to come to their own conclusions as well as their own consciousness and make peace with that, not to uh, uh, try to get away with anything, because if that's the case, don't even think about it, but to embrace your spiritual reality. And to live it fully in alignment with that belief system that you are validated and validating uh, through your communication with God directly through spirit, divine spirit, Holy Spirit, the act, however people call it. There are a lot of names for it. Uh, so there are practical and pragmatic steps that are very scary for people to take, but they have to get outside of that fear perspective and step completely away of it and recognize, is this spiritually correct? Is this spiritually not correct? So to summarize, you stopped using your social security number and uh, you did not get, you, you didn't get a marriage license with the state and your children do not have uh, birth certificates or anything like that. Did I had read um, recently, and I have not dug into this as much as I would like to, but you seem like possibly the person to discuss it with. I'd read that each of us is given a number when we're born that can actually be found on the stock exchange. And there's a process that you could do to actually like reclaim your identity and claim that number. Have you heard, is, is, am, am I talking complete babble right now or is, no, no, is there no, something I, to this? Yeah. I've come across that and many other things. And mm -hmm. uh, look, you're still playing a game with an artificial reality. Mm -hmm. and, and these are uh, economic constructs uh, involving uh, what we call law of equity and economics and, and, you know, detracting from your true identity, art, making you artificial, making you an artificial mm -hmm. creation of the state. In other words, incorporating you as not a creation of God, but a creation of the state. That's what a corporation is, mm -hmm. it's an artificial creation of the state. That's why corporations can be uh, regulated by their creator, right? But when we adopt a corporate identity, now we are subjugated, if you will, by volunteering, even in ignorance, to rules that are not ours spiritually, but ours as an alternate reality or alternate identity. So whether there's credence to that, and there may be, there's no question that the Social Security or tax ID number collateralizes you for a debt that can never, never be repaid, and you can't constitutionally question it. It's in one of the amendments. But uh, it, it alters you in seeking what is the Holy Grail as an economic uh, being. You know, wealth creation, accumulation of whatever the bankers say is wealth, Federal Reserve notes or other things versus our desire for spiritual enlightenment and reconnection to the source of all source, that divinity, our, you know, our, our birthright in divine love, for instance. 
Now, I'm not saying you can't engage in those things, but there is some level of a, a spiritual sacrifice or a sacrifice of your spiritual being made in, uh, let's say, displacing the pursuit of God and spirit with some kind of artificial economic uh, uh, holy grail, so to speak. I'm not making a judgment of anybody who has accumulated wealth, who wants to. I mean, we all got to find a way to get through life. Um, you know, I prefer to be paid in gold and silver or exchange, you know, good services through barter because we can each value uh, goods and services better than the Federal Reserve note that can be devalued by its very creation artificially. And it's being done in a very rapid fashion right now. So it comes back to an earlier discussion and topic of how do we survive, you know, the inevitable economic collapse? How long will it destroy us versus will we thrive, in fact, because it'll get us closer to spiritual integrity and relationships when something of meaning and value to one another can be exchanged in reality and we're not relying on third parties to intervene like those who asked for permission to marry get a third party intervener in their marriage the the state exists in that relationship where it used to be a religious thing and you and your wife and god you know that was a holy matrimony it's an unholy uh, alliance when you bring a third party called government and not god into that relationship so that's how i perceive life a little bit differently perhaps than many and you don't do it to get away or out of something as you do it to embrace your true nature, embrace your relationship with, you know, with creation itself. And so it's not, I don't know if I'm communicating this well. It's not running you are, away you from are. something as you moving are. towards something. Okay. So to be succinct on my end, do you believe or do churches, places of worship, synagogues, temples, whatever, have the ability to say, we're staying open no matter what. And if they do that, are they then uh, subjecting themselves to police coming in and criminal charges? I think that's what a lot of people are worried about is like, am I going to go to jail? Yeah, I just covered a story of a pastor in California uh, that uh, defied a court order to not have a service larger than 50 people. And he held like two services last Sunday, and it was full, packed to the gills, no social distancing, and so now they're threatening him with contempt, and they want to potentially jail him. Now, he could become a martyr for the cause, hopefully not in terms of a life and death scenario, but could rise up and hopefully wake up people of faith to realize that the government has no authority to do that, to, to stop the practice of religion. As long as, again, it's not violating the rights of others in the process, of course, the claim is that they're you know, endangering the lives of others because the simple act of breathing is now a criminal act, which is so absurd is that it's amazing that we even have to address it, right? The, the whole basis coming back around to the beginning, the germ theory, that whole basis is false or else we would, there would be no explanation for human and animal life. And now they're saying we can't live unless we mask ourselves and distance from one another and perceive each other as vectors for death and disease. Is that not a complete Luciferian takeover of the human uh, spirit to destroy it and distance it from its so own divinity? So is this not something a good lawyer could go in and just blow wide open? Or is it that there is so much money bribing the people in the positions that are decision makers that it could result in something ridiculous where it's, un it's, it's illegal, it's unconstitutional, and yet mm. this pastor could be jailed for it? Right. It is possible. I, I think... And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not giving legal advice, but I think anybody who has any legal knowledge could destroy and defeat uh, a charge of, of uh, you know, holding a worship service against a, a prohibition of doing so because government has the authority not does not have the authority to do that. Uh, but we live in a state of emergency, a perpetual state of emergency, which requires what we call the rule of necessity. The rule of necessity knows no law. So if we are in this perpetual emergency, never let a good crisis go to waste, then if the people go along, yeah, they could succeed in jailing pastors and shutting down churches, but it isn't because it's lawful or constitutional. It's because the people have abandoned uh, their sacred nature and that sacred relationship. And I'm not saying you can't be spiritual without going to church. That's not my point at all. But the freedom of association, the freedom of assembly, the freedom to come together and worship, that was a fundamental freedom enshrined in our Constitution, not because the Constitution granted it or the Bill of Rights granted it, but it was to prohibit government from ever encroaching upon it and prohibiting it or limiting it in any way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think it's a winning argument. Of course, if you get into the – we talked about issues of blackmail at different levels of government where they've got pictures of the judge doing some really nasty things with people underage – 
suddenly that judge is going to do whatever they're told to do. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of unlawful behavior and rooting out those, uh, you know, Luciferians is, is part of the process of shining the light by being the light. You know, yeah. if you don't necessarily have to point it out physically, but by, by being that a vehicle for God's love through you, miracles happen every day, every moment, every second. Mm -hmm. And we're convinced, oh, no, miracles, that only happen in the Bible. It's like, no, 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 miracles happen every moment. Mm -hmm. And they, don't, they didn't stop just because somebody stopped writing, you know, spiritual text. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's an ongoing thing, and we got to recognize that, or else we're always looking to our past and trying to bring the past and resurrect the past as opposed to recognize that divinity, that spirit flows right now in the here and now, and it always does. And the division in time is also a deception because we're always looking for it outside of ourselves as opposed to recognizing it and embracing it and being it right here and now, which is all we ever have. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple rapid fire questions. Um, spiritual texts that have had the biggest impact on you. Uh, well, I, I will say, of course, I grew up uh, in a Judeo-Christian uh, household or Judeo household and, and expanded, uh, you know, and to embrace all aspects of uh, Ju Judeo-Christian belief and the love and, and Christ teachings as well. Uh, but, you know, when I was, uh, let's see, right about that time, I had that awakening on medicine, right? 19 years of age. Uh, I, or just before that, I had uh, uh, gone to a friend's house, a childhood friend from back in elementary school. And uh, there was a book on his floor uh, in his room. We were just chatting on, it was Christmas break, you know, on my first year of college and he was working out in the world and stuff, talking about stuff. And I was, you know, my parents had gotten divorced. So, you know, I'd gone through crises of, you know, not necessarily faith per se, a little bit of crisis of faith in terms of orthodoxy and orthodox religion, because, you know, I, I'm the inquisitive guy, you might notice. And I always ask the questions that sometimes they got annoyed with me, whether it would be a rabbi, a priest, a pastor, whatever. I would ask the questions like, and, you know, one of those questions, just like I asked the doctors, you know, why am I sick? Will I ever be well? And they go, well, we don't know why you're sick. Well, I was honest. But when I asked similar questions to, to, to church and synagogue leaders, why do we have to, to wait to die to know what it is, you know, know of God and know of life after whatever it is? And, you know, and, and then they said just some things you just, you, you can't know until you die. And I was like, that always struck me as wrong. Not because I'm arrogant and egotistical, but it was because, look, if I am a spiritual being, if I believe I'm a creation of God, a creature of God, why do I have to wait? Not that I'm impatient, because I'm a patient guy. I can wait a long time for stuff. But, but it just didn't, it, it just struck me wrong. If you talk about a discordant tone. All I can say is like, but that, that was like petting the cat backwards. That doesn't feel right, you know? So what am I to do with that? I mean, I, I didn't want to be sacrilegious. I wasn't, you know, I'm not going to be yelling and screaming at these people. If that's what they believe, they believe that. But I didn't. And I just, you know, my prayers were primarily for healing because I suffered so much with ailments and illnesses and pains and discomforts. And so what happened in retrospect, and I see this now, I didn't know it at the time, I wasn't sent a miraculous healing like a lightning bolt from the sky. It appeared to me as this book in my friend's house that rooted me deeper in what I call spiritual practice and spiritual principles that didn't cause me to abandon Judeo-Christian principles, but got me a deeper level of understanding of them. And so it uplifted me to go to places that maybe only uh, uh, addressed superficially through practice. And uh, so I was sent a spiritual toolkit. Now, the book was called, for those interested, Ekin Carr, Key to Secret Worlds. Key to Secret Worlds. And in it provided these exercises. We've talked a lot about exercise today. Spiritual exercises to open up my connection and communication with God. Now, I think this can be done in any church or religion of divine, divinity and divine love. So I'm not here to convert anybody to anything. I'm just sharing you my story. You asked, and this is where we biohack. And that's why I say, if you heard the hue for the first time and you want to try it, you can be Christian, you can be Jewish, you could be Buddhist. You, it doesn't change your religion. My point is, this is a sacred word. It's a sacred name. It's even in the Bible. Some have argued that the root of hallelujah, uh, different names for God, Hugh is in that as well. And the lost word in the Bible. So I'm sensitive to everybody, as you can hear, because I've been bashed over the head with a Jesus stick in my life, growing up Jewish in the South, right? So I'm very sensitive to not you know, uh, beating anybody else up about it. And maybe I bend over too much and people go, just say it, just say it. I'm like, all right, that's my thing I'm carrying with me. I'm too sensitive. 
Uh, so the spiritual toolkit with the spiritual practices, the spiritual exercises of Eck or divine spirit, Holy Spirit. And that opened me up. Now, what was interesting about that is as I got rooted in these spiritual principles that are in all the texts as well, that I began to open up to the possibility of healing outside of the realm of allopathic pharmaceutical medicine. I wouldn't have recognized it, I don't think. I wouldn't have been open to it. But then four or five years later, that's when the homeopathic doctor appeared. And I was like, oh, wow, isn't that fascinating? Instead of going, oh, my gosh, is that demonic? Is that, is that something to be frightened of? Run away. Suddenly, I recognized things because I had developed a spiritual language with, with God that I could use every day. How does the language of spirit work for you? And, and again, my point is not to be overly sensitive that anybody from any religious background or religious teaching can have a deep connection. It's a matter of practice. And how does that language work for you? It works for you. It's an individual path ultimately. And if you, if you drill down on any, go to your church and go, drill down on everybody with question about, question about, about theology or belief, and you will find distinct differences in everybody in your church, even though you'll have basic level of agreement. So we are born as individuals, we are creations of God as individuals, and we are given the opportunity to establish our path in the midst of many paths, to take what we want, abandon the things we don't, but ultimately, if it's not uplifting me, me, I'll say this, bringing me more love into my life, divine love, and, and helping to uplift others, I'm like, well, then I'm on the wrong track. And so it's something that has worked well for me. If anybody's more interested in that, I'm happy to answer questions outside of this realm. If you want to send, we have like on our Patreon, uh, we have asked me anything. People ask some pretty interesting questions once a month when we do that outside of the show as well. Yeah, that's that's great. And I want to be respectful of your time and kind of uh, bring it home here after you know one or two more rapid fire questions, and you can make them as sure. as, as uh, brief or as lengthy as you want. Your your answers are fantastic so far. So key to to secret worlds. I need to check that out. Um, a couple of the practices that have had the biggest positive impact on your health. Uh, uh, practices of, for the health specifically? Yeah, let's say so from age 19 to now, mm -hmm. you're now very well versed in homeopathy. I'm sure you've right. tried a lot of different things. Um, right. You know, in addition to some of the spiritual practices sure. that, that, that you've already described, what else has had some of the... Sure. The, well, I, and I think it was, as I said, the spiritual practices that opened me up to the gifts <laughs> of healing that I truly desired and prayed for. Right. It's funny because I was like, well, God, why didn't you just strike me with a lightning bolt and heal me? It's like, no, I had to work my tushy off. Right. Say mm -hmm. it kindly and nicely to learn the principles and apply them. And it wasn't always fun and pleasant and easy. So I don't want anybody to think, oh, my gosh, he learned that and miracle overnight. Bing, bang, boom. He was great. It was two years of intensity from the age of 24 when I first learned about this. I had to change my diet radically from a standard American diet, fast food, you name it. I grew up on it to an organic diet back when. If you went into a health food store to find organic food, it was wilted lettuce and bean sprouts. I'm like, dude, that's not good. Now you can get all the organic junk food you want. You can get mm -hmm. organic pizzas, right? So mm -hmm. switching from chemically grown, now processed GMO foods, all of that, to organic or clean quality equivalent. It could not even be certified if you know it's clean. Mm -hmm. That, to me, goes back to my Jewish heritage, kosher, kashrut, cleanliness, right? Although mm -hmm. I think they should update the language to include you know what? You should avoid additives, preservatives, flavorings, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, GMOs, plasticizers, all that stuff. So I would update it. If that's sacrilegious, so be it. Uh, and then so that dietary shift was different. I had to believe that I was worthy of making these choices and changes that I could be healed. Mm -hmm. I had to believe it. And that was part of the spiritual practices because a lot of times we're our own worst enemy. More often so, than not, we're the block, right? Is that, are we talking self-love? Certainly, yeah. Well, self-worth, self-love. If you don't recognize that you are a creation of God, uh, it's easy to go, why should I love myself? I'm a piece of whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I know that some say humility means you have to look at yourself that way, but uh, I, that didn't so much work for me. But it's not in an arrogant, egotistical way that you say, I acknowledge my divinity, not so I can rule over other people. That's not of interest to me. I mean, maybe it is for others, but man, I got enough problems of my own. Why would I want to take on anybody else's? You know, mm. so it's pragmatic. You know, a lot of my mm. steps were pragmatic and practical. So switching the diet, remineralizing, learning about minerals from food, getting them in the right form. Homeopathy, of course, was key to me because it used uh, subtle frequencies or, or, or quantum signaling to my body to correct what has been you know, discordant, if you will, including and especially liver 
toxicity, kidney toxicity, lymph, all of that. So I have to move the things out that have been accumulating, heavy metals and other things for my entire life to that point. So two years of intense work and then a lifetime because we're exposed to things we can't account for even if we do the best we can. So it's an ongoing endeavor. Uh, and I never looked back and sense that said, you know, some people said, oh, you'll do that organic thing for a little while and you'll be back to this. Like, no, it wasn't a fad. It was a way and it is a way of life to care for this temple. If you believe uh, it's uh, uh, sacred, and, and treat it as such. You know, people take care of their cars better than they take care of their bodies, right? They wouldn't dare put the wrong kind of gas in, right? So these are the kind of concepts that are pretty simple to understand, but you know, maybe harder to apply because we've got attachments to certain behaviors and addictions. And, you know, it's like, oh man, I don't want to give that up. But in giving things up that you thought were valuable, you find what's really valuable. And then you go, that wasn't really a give up at all. This was a great trade. If you want to call it a trade, I got the best of the best, man. I'm loved. I am loved. And I love, you know, it's like, dude, come on. Who's, who would not want that? So, but people don't, they have to suffer. I suffered until I said, you know what? I really want that. And that's part of the freedom and the gift of things that don't happen to us. They happen for us. And God loves us enough to allow, allow us to suffer enough to wake up and come back by choice, by our own volition, not by force and fraud and deceit and deception and, you know, all of that. Robert Scott Bell. This has been one of my favorite conversations on the Biohacking Secrets show. Very timely right now and a lot of, a, a lot of great wisdom you've shared. Um, but wait, there's more. Oh, please. <laughs> Gee, there's always more. We I'm, I'm ready. Going, but I don't <laughs> want to overwhelm. You've paid for the, the whole seat, but you're only going to need the edge. Um, uh, <laughs> wait, before you kind of share with people where they can yeah. keep up with things you're working on, you know, yeah. I know you've got the Robert Scott Bell show. Um, what, what is one parting piece of actionable advice for the people who find themselves amidst this, this COVID craziness? They have a feeling that things aren't uh, adding up, right? Mm -hmm. That something's off. What is yeah. your, your, your recommendation to those listeners? Well, it's the same thing I, I try to share every day on the show. And, and it's not anything out of the ordinary of what we've been discussing. It's uh, get back to your source, get reconnected to the source of all sources. And, you know, whether you call it God or spirit, you know, again, I, everybody's got different names for it. If we don't center ourselves there again, we are subject to this deception. Now, many people, as you say, are feeling it. They're sensing something's off, something's wrong. The question is, will we be led by fear or will we be led by our true origin? And if we are, then all of that just dissipates. It doesn't become impactful in a negative sense in your life. And the opportunity for spiritual growth at this time is per perhaps greater than ever. Now, in a life of ease in the West, we sort of describe that as I described my experience briefly in going to West Africa. As much as I was impressed and amazed with the absolute reliance on divine spirit to get through the day these people had, they almost didn't have a choice. We have had an incredible abundance and ease to not make the choice to go for a God, to go for divinity, right? And so if we choose it while things are relatively easy and accessible, man, that's impressive, honestly. That's just me looking at people going, well, you chose that when you had all of this other stuff? You could have, that was, you know, yeah. Now we're being given an opportunity because maybe not enough of us took the opportunity to choose while we had it easy. That there's a time that is, we are in the midst of, that the things that were just automatic are not going to be automatic. And yeah. so it's going to be more obvious to people. It's like, I got to turn back to God, right? When, when things are difficult, suddenly now you pray, right? There are no atheists in a foxhole, as they say. But uh, it doesn't mean that we're going to have to go into the Great Depression. You know, there are people that do well in those things as well. And I'm not saying to take advantage of people that are destitute. That's not what I'm saying. But the opportunity for spiritual unfoldment and all of the gifts that come from that and through that can happen at any time, in the best of times, the worst of times, in between those times. All of those things are just kind of the illusion that help move things along, to give people the experiences that they actually need to unfold spiritually. So, uh, you know, no matter what we, if we say we curse what's happening now or we embrace it, the fact of the matter, it's happening in a divine order, regardless of what we say about Luciferian agendas. Those are all just distractions at the same time they are here to uplift us too. So it's, it's a bizarre place to get to when you look at all of it and go, oh, it's all in perfect order. While at the same time we go, man, did you see what that guy did? Do you see what that politician did? All of that's real, you know, at the same time it's illusion. So mm -hmm. that's why I say we can keep going and I don't think we'll run out of things. I mean, you've asked some 
fantastic questions that got me to go places I rarely go in an interview because we don't get to go there. So uh, hopefully it hadn't been frightening. Hopefully it's been uplifting for folks. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm, I'm yeah. thrilled by it. I was more trying to be respectful of your time. And honestly, I could, I could do a, a part two um, anytime. You know, I guess sure. last, last two questions there, you, you, we could have just ended there. And that was like a great, you know, kind of bring it home. But I've, I'm curious about these and I'm going to ask you when we're off the air. So I might as well ask you because sure. maybe there's listeners that are curious. Um, <clears throat> from everything that you know right now, mm-hmm. Do you believe that Donald Trump is in there fighting the good fight against the deep state? Or do you think that is a disinformation campaign to get people to give their power away? Okay. That's a fair question. It's a tough one because there are so many strong beliefs on both sides of this equation. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm of the opinion, and part of it is because of the experience I had with someone who is near and dear to me, almost like an adopted mom who worked with Donald Trump in business for 10 years as an advisor. I mean, pretty intensely. So I got to know Trump indirectly through her experience of him and, and his, her observations of him. And so uh, I don't doubt that he loves America, the ideals of America, this country, deeply, truly, not, not a fiction, not, not a pretend, not putting it on. Uh, and he's also a very good reader of energy. Like he can enter a room and scan the room and know exactly who's in it for nefarious schemes. At the same time, then I go, well, how come he still has Fauci there, right, as we're talking today? And, and yet, I recognize that in the midst of trying to, 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 you know, do some good things for America and get us back on some level of a course that, that loves liberty and defends freedom, and for him, it's a lot about business, of course, economic freedom. Uh, there is such a deep, deep, deep state that has been entrenched for, if we could call it hundreds, if not thousands of years of record, you know, even beyond recorded history, of attempts to deceive us, to enslave us. So he's dealing with that in a geopolitical standpoint as well, as much as the man is a spiritual man, claims to be a, a, a Christian. And some people will say, well, he was not very Christian-like, but you know, everybody's judging everything in that regard. And I don't, I don't tend to go that way. It's a difficult task to be a president of the United States because there is such a cabal that exists before you get there and even after you leave there. So I believe his attempts are sincere uh, there are limits to being able to, to deal with that deep state and successfully uh, dismantle it because part of it is for our spiritual unfoldment to be deceived and to be enslaved, to find out what, how valuable freedom is. And that is spiritual freedom as well as religion is being attacked very directly by what's happening now in the era of COVID crazy. Uh, so um, I don't know if this is a cop-out answer, but I believe he's sincere and wants to do good, but he's also subject to a lot of dark forces to limit what he could do, even if he intends to do good things. And that's where I say there are no political saviors. Don't Mm -hmm. look to Donald Trump to save you. Even if he's trying to do good work, we must do things on the localist of local levels. And part of what we discussed today is withdrawing consent, getting back to establishing real relationships with real humans in your environment to uplift and help one another, right? Mm -hmm. To genuinely be kind and loving to one another, which it's hard to happen on a global scale, and it can't happen on a global scale until it, until it can happen on the localist of local scales. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't even know if I answered the question. You did. You did. It was great. Okay. L- last, mm-hmm. last question that's slightly off topic, but very interesting mm-hmm. to me because I, I mean, I just, um, I've been buying gold for a couple of years, and then I just bought some silver literally today from, uh, from Gainesville Coins mm-hmm. online. How do, you, when, how do you get paid in gold and silver? What's this process look like? Because I'm sure people are like, what? Sure. Well, it's basically, you know, contract law. You contract to work in in gold or silver. You can get it denominated in dollars because whether it be pre-1964, you know, uh, silver coins or whether it be pre-19, what was it? uh, When it was uh, 1920, when was it 34 or whatever, when they took the gold out of circulation? Yeah. They reissued it. It used to be a $20 gold piece was one ounce. So $20 was, was an ounce of gold. Uh, oh then <laughs> under Reagan, he reinstituted the mint, you know, pr- uh, minting uh, gold and silver coins denominated in dollars because he, he realized he was made aware and partly uh, by Larry McDonald, who went down in uh, the Cal 007. Remember the South Korean uh, airliner that got shot down supposedly over Russia and uh, Ron Paul as well played a role in that and recognizing that under the law of nations, if you don't have an independent treasury, uh, you aren't an, you aren't a sovereign nation, right? So they realized he had to uh, recoin money again uh, outside of the Federal Reserve System through the Treasury. And now, of course, uh, uh, one ounce of gold is, is denominated as a $50 gold coin. 
Uh, so in reality, and, and a one ounce coin is a silver is still considered a dollar uh, from you know the treasury. So you can get paid in, do, in lawful money of account uh, denominated in dollars. So uh, people will then say, well, you were paid, what's the price of gold? $2,000 an ounce. You were given an a one ounce coin. You were given $2,000. No, no, you weren't. It says right on there, it's $50 or $20 if you go back in time. Uh, and, uh, you know, so who gets to define what a dollar is? Is the Federal Reserve note a dollar? So I'm answering more than I should be at this point, but I'm just letting you know. Um, there are other ways now, uh, Utah gold backs, there's about to be Nevada gold backs. These are um, uh, innovations in technology that allow gold to be imprinted or embedded in the note itself so that you're not having to rely upon somebody securing it in a vault and deceiving you potentially. Uh, so fractional uh, ability to have gold as money uh, is, is, is evolving. And of course, there are issues of digitizing money, which is a whole other realm of Federal Reserve notes to the nth degree, I guess. Uh, but if we were to be able to choose our form of money, that's what contract law and the common law is. It, you know, people say, well, that doesn't work anymore. doesn't exist. Well, you know, if you don't consent to that other system, uh, there's a certain point when you realize spiritually it's more correct, just weights and measures, I think, are referenced in the Bible as well. And we are being deceived with uh, so-called paper money, not, uh, you know, the money wasn't backed by gold. It was gold is the point. People forget that. And then right. uh, there's all kinds of de-evolutions in it through Bretton Woods agreements and Bretton Woods, too, and the breakdown of the monetary system. Now we're dealing with petrodollars as long as gunboat diplomacy works, and we have armed forces to keep the free flow of oil going, so-called free flow, and that our, our money is based on that, as well as the, the kids and grandkids that are yet to be born that are collateralized for the debt automatically when they're born and given birth certificates and numbered like cattle in the field with, you know, antisocial insecurity numbers. These are international banking numbers. They're not, they don't really have anything to do with the United States de jour, uh, a constitutional Republican form of government. So, uh, dude, like I said, we can talk about a lot of stuff. And if we want yeah. to do a part two, I'm, I'm happy to do it. You might get inquiries to say, Hey, that was interesting about that. Can you talk more about I, that? I, I think that'd be a, I think that'd be a blast. And most of the people who've made it to this, to this point would definitely be up for a part two. Um, so I'm, I'm that invite is extended and we can kind of, I mean, we can, we can book it as soon as possible. And, um, we, and we just met as far as I know today on this thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, who is this guy? He's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. The, the feeling is mutual, my friend. Um, where, where can people stay up to date with cool things you're working on, books, your show, all that fun stuff? Yeah, just as long as we have it, robertscottbell.com. Uh, we've been banned temporarily at times by other social media, but you know, we're still there, you know, the, the Facebooks and, and, and YouTubes of the world. So you, you can find a lot. A lot of our archives are done at Brideon. Mike Adams, the health ranger, allows for non-censored versions too. Mm, so in case nice. we ever get shut down, we've got alternatives and, and uh, we've tried to be redundant in many systems of, of communicating out there through the digital platforms as well. I cover a lot of health and healing topics a lot, which we didn't cover today. You know, we, could talk <laughs> we, about, we should probably talk about some yeah, of that. We could talk that, about we'll get that part two. key technologies for 5G remediation, double-blind placebo control. Is that a Tesla coil? No, this is a, a key technology. A German scientist, a young man, developed this technology, a water-based technology. doesn't require electricity that produces a torus field of electrons that depolarizes the field uh, and protects you, not in a, a placebo way or a muscle testing way. It's like a double blind placebo test done on human and animal. Uh, what is that called? If our listeners want to check that out. Oh, QI key technology. It's uh, available through Synergy Science. Um, at robertscottbell.com, there's actually a banner. Uh, you can click on it and that usually will get you your best price too. But um, there's larger ones for whole houses. And it, again, there are stories I can tell you about my wife's journey and everything that all right to that this also, is what we're going to do we're going to book you know yeah. mediation so yeah let's book part two i want to talk about silver i want to talk about the the some of these frequency devices and um if you're up for it i would love to 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 book it and kind of uh dive into the health stuff because i mean i've got uh i've got a soma vedic here i mean you might be able to see it that thing growing yeah. and then uh at the other end of the room i've got uh blue Very shield cool cube um so big on frequency devices we, yeah we have to and, and, and again for me it and i'm a homeopath but it doesn't mean i just believe everything people tell me right mm -hmm. i need some level of scientific validation i you know i, I i've gone through you know university level uh training uh, microbiology etc so 
I don't, I'm not an anti-science. I think people who claim to be scientists and doctors are anti-science right now with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to address these things and remediate technology, technology is not evil in and of itself, but when it is indiscriminate and cares not for consequence, then yeah, it's problematic. But I think spirit can inspire as it did this young scientist to develop this technology can mm -hmm. inspire us to protect ourselves in the midst of that. So even if they are successful going 5G and 6G, we have the ability to, to survive within it and even thrive within it. And that's something that, you know, my belief and faith in God helps me, but it's, it's not just that. It's the faith that spirit can inspire us, even technologically, to counter the evil technology. That is technology without consciousness. Especially when we make it our intention for spirit to work through us. Yeah, beautiful. Exactly. Yes. Well said. Robert Scott Bell, this has been a pleasure. We will do a part two. Guys, if you like this episode and you get any value, make sure that you check out robertscottbell.com and all of the cool things that he's got there. And uh, let him know that you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Anthony.